Broadcasting live from the Zimmer Communications World Headquarters. This is Wake Up Mid-Missouri. Get ready, pal. But the Bible tells us that there's a time for every purpose under heaven. Pulling across the country over the past six months, I came here to say it's become clear to me, this is not my time. So after much prayer and deliberation, I have decided to suspend my campaign for president effective today. Big news over the weekend, another person dropping out of the 2024 race. And Thank honestly, <laughs> were you surprised? I'm actually surprised. I'm surprised he yeah. even said he was going to run. Yeah, and I have hated watching him in all of the debates so far because he just comes off so arrogant. I don't know what it is. He's just very abrasive and... He's missing the mark, I think. He said, now is not my time. And I thought in my mind, I don't think it's ever going to be your time. (laughs) I was kind of surprised, like you said, though. I was, too. My husband actually told it. And I said, what? No, really? And and Hannah, I think going back to what you said, just the arrogance and, you know, kind of like that he was entitled to it. I was actually shocked that he went ahead and did it. Now, of course, I think Larry Elder dropped out last week. We also lost, I think, two or three other contenders. Right. (laughs) Um, What, Perry Johnson, someone else. Um, But I think I was looking at the polling, and, I mean, it was not looking good for Pence. Pence, I think, was averaging on real clear about 3.5%. Trump, of course, is averaging about 60. Um, And, I mean, even Ramaswamy was beating Pence. He's sitting at 4.5, and and I'm thinking, that's kind of embarrassing, really. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't think that Pence had a chance but I guess I am surprised that he dropped out this early. I figured he'd be one of the clingers that thought they had a chance. Yeah. I totally agree. Well, Kind of the ego thing keeping him around. A hundred percent. Well, Ben Carson was uh, endorsing uh, Trump. He was in Iowa today, or Iowa this weekend, so was Trump. Does Do these endorsements matter, John, you think? No. I don't think so either. Um, but I mean, I mean, they sound good in the press, but that's about as far as I think it goes with the average voter out there. Yeah, and so I guess my question would be, what what is this? Is this a domino effect of people dropping out? Like I said, we had Larry Elder last week. We got Pence this week. You know, can we get that field narrowed down? I still think um, I still think it's going to be Trump. Um, but what happens once you know, if some of these people with a more significant percentage start dropping out, where do those numbers go? Um, but I don't think I don't think I see Vivek Ramaswamy dropping out anytime soon. So um, big news though in the 2024 presidential primary, we've got a loaded show today we're going to talk to boone county commissioner janet thompson at 6 35 um there is a second round of arpa funds uh coming out and she's going to let us know when we can expect that and um and what might be different about the process uh this time around there's a lot of money on the line and i know there were a lot of disappointed um a lot of folks who were disappointed uh this last round when they missed out on the funding so we're going to hear from her and then we'll hear from caleb browden and he had a really big weekend um obviously he announced his secretary of state run at the mizzou homecoming parade but then he was on the eagle on fred perry's show this weekend um had some powerful things to say right brian he did uh in to say the least i mean i i've pulled three sound bites from that interview stephanie and uh, and one of the things he talked about, obviously, was was gaming. And I'm going to have that at the bottom of the hour on the Eagle, but I'll just reference it right now. He basically blamed Senator Denny Hoskins for the defeat of gaming, basically saying Hoskins wants slot machines in gas stations. And that's a very controversial issue. It's tied up in litigation. Um, and Senator Rowden pinned it on, on that. Senator Hoskins fired back at Senator Rowden last night saying that Hoskins or saying that Rowden is basically carrying the water for the casinos and he's basically saying we need to find a dedicated funding source for the um, for the veterans homes which which is interesting these two men respect each other they really do they are colleagues if Caleb didn't like him he could remove him as as, uh, as chairman of, of a key committee he is not they get along they disagree on a number of issues. They're both Republicans, and clearly, they're just in the way they're talking right now. I just don't see sports wagering passing because 
there's just they're 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 in a they uh, just bumped a, heads over and, it for and, so and, long. And, and haven't so, they? Unless something ha- the house can pass it all they want, but right now you'll hear the sound bite. It is very very powerful. Well, and they're both now running for Secretary of State, <laughs> exactly. so that is just intensifying yeah. the fight. So again, we'll be talking to Caleb Rowden uh, around seven ten this morning, and then um, at around eight ten we'll talk to Frank Catanzaro. He's the chairman of the Missouri Young Republicans. I want to hear him weigh in on this twenty twenty four presidential race. I think early on we thought a lot of the young people might be with Vivek Ramaswamy, but I wonder if they're now, like a lot of people, moving kind of all in for Trump. So that will be at 810. If you are just waking up this morning, it's cold outside. (laughs) It's freezing. (laughs) Actually, after all the rain we got yesterday, and of course it got cold overnight, my door was a little frozen this morning on my car. Yeah, just a little bit. Well, today's high is 41. Uh, So you're going to want to put on your coat. But sunny. Sunny. All right. Yeah, that's better than we had this weekend. Also, um, tomorrow's high is 40. So that is going to be a cold Halloween. And I already saw a lot of folks um, who do uh, gatherings and some other organizations trying to move their stuff inside or even canceling some of these events. So that's kind of disappointing because it's 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 a, usually a fun week. But in, in California, really and to Hannah's point too about the rain, you you know I I have my own feelings about the rain gauge here in Columbia because I know it's low weather service last night in st louis officially in in columbia which is the official observation station jeff city would be similar i'm sure they they measured it at about 0.6 on saturday inches and about 0.6 inches on sunday let me tell you folks we had more rain than that um maybe twice as much just that gauge where, where it is but the point is it was a miserable wet wet weekend and it was cold it, it was cold and the, the sun's going to help today but it's still going to be cold for for october yeah well despite all of the rain that didn't stop uh apparently a car chase in jefferson <laughs> city and we had kind of a bizarre uh, a different show on friday so we didn't get to pick winners and losers but i think this morning we have to pick for a winner has to be the jeff city police department and they put out a release yesterday John, what are the main details of this thing? No, uh, the, the car chase was kind of a crazy one down Missouri Boulevard the other day. I think it was Saturday. And somebody was alleged that they stole a whole bunch of stuff from the Ulta Cosmetics store, ran out to a waiting car, took off, sped across the Missouri River Bridge, where Callaway County deputies finally put out some tire deflators. Then a couple of the people in the car bailed out and ran, and finally they caught them all and brought them in but and now i think they're identifying them all being from the st louis area i have so many questions like only two people decided to run what was the, uh, what, <laughs> the other like, the third just knew like, could we get a seat belt off <laughs> maybe i don't know and that could but, be resisting they'll just throw resisting arrest charges on the two on the two that on the two that ran but you know um the, the felon in possession or whatever uh, you know that just that's not good because you're, you're talking you know that potentially carries a 10-year prison sentence sure if you're going to get a getaway car driver i think he also was driving while suspended and yes. he was a felon in possession so maybe of get course, somebody <laughs> because why not <laughs> not great but i mean so we talk about how this stuff impacts us and i think again brian i think it was said in the release that these folks were from st louis that's right but i think it's a good reminder to any people thinking they want to do crimes that uh mid missouri is not california and that yeah. even if you're going to go pick steal, a more woke community if yeah. you're going to shoplift yeah, yeah. and so what, and jeff city police went and they've used tri- spike strips and you know th- th- this we don't we don't we don't know their names so we can't get court documents as john knows yet but you know this potentially could be an organized ring but it sounds to me like they knew exactly where they were going i mean obviously a- across the bridge but you're right i mean it's it's <laughs> It's, uh, Does it, it sound it's, that organized, though, Brian? Well, it, when I say, it, 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 you know, that's a that's a term that the uh, the media uses, but you, but certainly I know what you're saying. But uh, that is that is an issue. But um, it's you know, again, we we can pass all the gun laws we want, and that's for discussion with you guys. But the reality is, this this person, you know, felon in possession, and then yeah. possibly going to bad be charged. guys don't care about gun laws. They'll just but that that's where the prosecutors can get them out as felon in possession. I that that's how the the Waffle House suspect went down. He was acquitted of murder, but he went to prison because he had a gun at the Waffle House. Now well, he argued he was defending himself, but I mean that that is something that they that felon in possession of a firearm is I see it used a lot. And they don't always go up to 10 years, but I've seen it used for up to 10 years. That's the maximum. It's serious, but I think I mean it just sends the right message and I saw a lot of people 
um, cheering that um, press release on when I read it. I was like, yeah, go get them. Because it's just, it's been so sad watching in some of these communities when they know what they can steal, you know, hundreds of dollars and they know they're not going to be prosecuted. And it's like, not here. That's that's not how we live. And so I just, I, I was so glad to see that. And so I hope, you know, we, we just mentioned that uh, criminals don't follow gun laws, but I hope they're paying attention. Maybe they read, do you think they read press releases on Facebook? I sure hope they do, John. I think most of their attorneys might after the fact. Yeah, I think if they do read them, they think, oh, I'm smarter than that. It won't happen to me. Well, I think people, uh, I mean, if I, surely they talk, but I'm I'm hoping, you know, if they see this, they think, man, not only are they, are we going to get charged, they will lay down the spike strips and chase us in a car and on foot after some makeup. I think they had a whole trash bag. You know how much money, it was probably a lot of money. I was going to say the press release said that there were a couple bag fulls. I'm yeah. thinking, man, that is a store that you could spend some serious cash. I think so. Yeah, we'll have to, maybe it'll eventually release how much money is coming out. Well, again, um, we are pre- getting prepared for the Daily DC Rundown. There was a big uh, story this weekend with Pence dropping out of the race. Um, a, a reminder to everyone that it is very cold this morning. It's 41. Um, and so, or the high is 41. I don't know what the current temperature is, but you need to wear a coat today. Um, we- <laughs> how many kids will be going Halloween is one, the abominable.
is AI is kind of a fancy thing. It's first of all, it's two letters. It means <laughs> artificial intelligence. This is Wake Up Mid Missouri, and I am Stephanie Bell, sitting in as host this morning, and it is time for our daily DC rundown. Big news out of DC today, the Biden administration, it leaked out last week that they are going to issue an executive order um, about AI, but is are these the people we want regulating AI, Hannah? Um, I mean, if they could find some intelligence of any kind, <laughs> I would be for that. So Ar- if it's artificial ar- or otherwise, <laughs> yeah, if it's artificial, it's better than nothing. It really is. Well, we're getting some of the details. Um, Biden and Harris are uh, supposed to have um, meet today and kind of describe more of what's going on in this e- um, executive order. Of course, they can't do a whole lot without Congress. And in, in order to fund any of these initiatives, they're going to need Congress's help. But for now, uh, Bruce Reed, the president's deputy chief of staff on policy, said this is the strongest set of actions any government in the world has ever taken on AI security and trust. Um, We'll see as we learn the details. Apparently, they're using the Korean War era Defense Production Act to track companies developing powerful AI systems. We're also getting really big government orders out of the Biden administration, which we're not surprised. The order directs every federal agency to create the position of chief AI officer. Apparently, there are already several of those um, agencies that have that position. Um, They're also issuing guidance to um, potentially to private folks like um, federal contractors on how to keep AI algorithms from being used to exacerbate discrimination. So don't um, let the robots discriminate against anybody if you're involved with the federal government. Also, there's some stuff in there about data privacy. Um, Again, in order to really go forward on a lot of these things, they're gonna need Congress's help. Um, And it's kind of a mess in DC. Do we feel like the chaos is over or that it's just beginning? (laughs) Biden's still in office, right? Well, we have a stay tuned. He's he's even going after the new House Speaker. He is. Well, we do. That didn't take long. We do have a new House Speaker, but the question is, um, we have these looming budget deadlines. So, uh, actually, folks are kind of saying maybe we should give this guy some grace. He's new. Maybe we should uh, push this deadline down. So Johnson has actually floated passing another continuing resolution to basically kick the can down the road to either January or April. And at least some people, even some in the Freedom Caucus, who've been pretty staunch on, you know, these CR or pretty opposed to these CR resolutions. um, He says, well, he deserves some time. You know, we did lose three weeks. So that's very diplomatic. But is it a good thing for our policy Uh... to just pass these stopgap measures and not to actually lay down the law and have these real budget fights? No, no, it's not. I don't think so. I don't think (laughs) it's too much fun. It is really a lot of fun. And, you know, part of McCarthy's problem was that he had this big, um, you know, they made the rule change that allowed people to oust him just a single member. And so Mike Johnson has been asked, like, hey, are you going to meet the same fate as McCarthy under these new rules? Or are you going to try to change the rules to secure your power? um, (laughs) And no pressure and try to stay in. And so Mike Johnson over the weekend, he did say he's not afraid of changing the rule. Of course, he wouldn't be afraid. He wants to protect himself. Um, But he isn't afraid of changing the rule on vacating the speakership. Um, and others actually said they would support that um, support that change. Um, he did say that the change is not his top priority. Um, his highest priority, of course, is to get the work done, you know, like they've been doing the last three weeks. Which it's probably a yeah. good idea that his top priority isn't making rules that benefit him. Isn't probably a good idea. That I, I think you're right. Well, of course, they're going to be having this um, this debate about foreign aid. And we heard about the Biden package. Um, and Biden wanted to roll in money for um, for the border, for Ukraine, and for Israel. Um, and a lot of people are saying, hey, we've got to separate these out and decide them um, individually. It's really interesting. We're getting a lot of tweets from uh, Congress members over the weekend. And for instance, Thomas Massey, who I generally really like, he tweeted out that the House is expected to vote on this $14.5 billion aid package. And he said, I conducted a Twitter poll. And... of the people that voted in the poll said neither country, neither Ukraine or Israel should receive the money. And so I'm going to be voting no. And in my mind, this kind of brings up two questions. A, where are our mid-Missouri folks at? His poll said, who do you want money for? Is Ukraine and Israel, neither country, only Israel or only Ukraine? And in his poll, again, folks were really in support of neither country. Also, should our uh, Congress members be voting based on the results of a Twitter poll? No. 
I mean, I guess it's nice to kind of take people's temperature, but he, like, the tweet's so weird because he says, look, I put out this Twitter poll, and it, that is, that's very like Elon Musk. I put out this poll, and people said this, and this is how I'm going to go in and vote. I, I really, I think we should be careful there. Um, but, I, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't think, you know, we've watched that so many times in the elections, that polling uh, is good for those of us in the media, but the real folks out there are like, yeah, whatever. Where do you think mid-Missourians are on this, John? I think they're probably... I think they're probably on only Israel at this point. I think you're probably right. Well, you can text Mark us. Alford kind of even alluded to that the other day when we had him on. Yeah, well, if you have thoughts, are you in...
Huh, you know? <laughs> She's rude, I'll tell you that. Uh... That is Nate Bargatze. He was on Saturday Night Live uh, this last weekend, and usually I'm not really into it, but he is kind of, I feel like he's a friend of the show. We play a lot of his clips. I think he does really clean com comedy, and he is hilarious. They have posted uh, his full monologue on Twitter, and I really enjoyed getting to see him. Um, now, we are joined by Janet Thompson. She is a Boone County commissioner. They have just issued um, recently uh, the first round of ARPA funding, and uh, they are getting ready to issue the second round of funding. So welcome to the show, Janet. And I wanted to ask you, what's the t when can we start expecting to see these applications? Janet? I can hear somebody. I just can't hear her. <laughs> hello? Uh, hello? Oh, hi, Janet. Hi, you went, you went dark. Oh, sorry about that. Well, hey, so on the second round of ARPA funding, I, you know, I heard a lot of chatter with the first round of funding that there were, you know, some disappointed uh, organizations out there um, who didn't receive the funding that they wanted. So for those people and for folks who maybe weren't aware or didn't get an application in, you know, what, what is the timeline of the second round of ARPA funding? So um, it is, we are hoping that we will get this um, second round going um, in probably early 2024, um, we'll put out the, the word just like we did the last time. It will also, I mean, we'll, we'll do a press release and all that kind of stuff, and we'll have it on the county website um, indicating the process by which people will apply um, and hope to, the money has to be, obligated fully obligated by the end of 2024 so that's a hard stop uh, so but we hope to get everything um underway in the first half of 2024 so it's a it's a use it or lose it kind of thing right well it's again uh, um the the regulations the the um statute and the regulations all say you have to fully obligate the money by the end of 2024. You have to fully spend it by the end of 2026. So, uh, so my, yeah. my understanding is Boone County got $35 million, but we only issued 12 in that first round. Why wouldn't we have issued half? I mean, it sounds like we still have a lot of money to spend. Well, so, um, so $10 million of that was actually um, retained by the county to pay for um, projects that are county-driven. The remainder of that is um, is available. We um, we will spend it all, um, and and so there's there's not a question about that. You know, um, when people say though that, gosh, um, we didn't get we didn't get the opportunity to uh, apply or um, didn't get the didn't get funded. There were 27 applications that were funded. There were over a hundred applications total, with a total ask of over eighty-four million dollars. Wow! Yeah. It's, so yeah, yeah. So you know, when you look at it, um, the funding that Boone County got, while it sounds it sounds huge, um, you know, Boone County and the City of Columbia and other municipalities within Boone County that got funding together, we we really we didn't even get. Eighty-four million dollars worth of, of funds to spend here in Boone County, and the need is huge. Uh, so rest assured, everything is gonna everything's gonna be spent, and um, and the real the real question becomes um, trying to make those just and they're tough decisions, right? You, you never realize how um, how challenging it can be <laughs> to allocate funds until you see that. Um, you're having to turn down um, what seems to be really good projects, but it's really the question becomes, are they sustainable? Are they transformative? Because that's part of the legislation is, is how is, um, is a project sustainable? Is it transformative? Is it going to make um, that systemic difference in how our community looks and acts? And so, um, you know, it's, I think the decisions on that first round were were solid um, in terms of both of those kind of 
um, load stars, but um, we're looking forward to seeing what else. And, and because somebody was turned down in the first round, that doesn't mean that they should say, you know, should pack up their marbles and go home. Um, if, if I were um, an agency that didn't get funded the first time, I would look carefully at the legislation to see if there's something I can do to beef up my application, and I'd resubmit. Commissioner, we appreciate your time. And just to reiterate to listeners, and you know this, Commissioner, but I want to reiterate because we've got a wide, on, wide audience who may not know the numbers. Columbia has received $25 million in federal ARPA money, and you're right, Boone County, $35 million separate on that. Yep. And, uh, and of course, you've, you've got a, a lot to go. I was just uh, about a week and a half ago, I was down at the Boone County Nature School, which is just south of Columbia, uh, between yep. Columbia and Ashland. I know all the commissioners were there as well. Huge project. Uh, just I was just just stunned at that beautiful gazebo, the 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 council house, if you will, if you uh, if you will, one hundred yeah. one hundred eleven acre project in three creeks. Boone County and ARPA money is committed, according to Mr. Kendrick, about four hundred thousand dollars to it. Tell us about that project. Wh- why you're so impressed with it, and what what uh, what impresses you so much about it? Well, you know, it's number one. It Um, It gives an opportunity for every kid in Boone County, every school district in Boone County, while it's sort of under the supervision in part of Columbia Public Schools, it is available to every single child, um, school-aged child in Boone County to, to participate in programs out there. And, you know, the Three Creeks area is such a vital part of our ecosystem here in Boone County. Um, We, as a community, we were so fortunate that the Waters family made that property available um, because it really gives kids an opportunity not only to be out in nature if they're if they're a city kid but also to see the importance of those ecosystems at work and um, especially like I say down in in that area I think it's really important we were we were really blown away by the by the plans and by the participation of the um, Department of Natural Resources um, in this project, and and to see that um, the, that collaboration between the school district and um, and the state in in that in that work is really important because it it gears kids towards an understanding of the world in which they live um, and and to cherish that world. So I think especially now when, you know, news is often um, has dire um, kind of warnings that nature school is something really positive that every kid in Boone County can really enjoy and learn from. And I know another um, project I think that was funded was the Southern Boone Schools, and that was for greenhouses to kind of expand some of the the nature and the mm-hmm. the teaching that they're doing out there. So I, I know yeah. personally my kids have done the Garden Club, and so I'm excited uh, to see them expand that programming because I do think it's yeah. really important. So we it's, are sp- – is- Yeah, it's so important, you know, and I just remember when Jenny Grabner first started talking about um, those those projects and it's really come into fruition. And we were thrilled to be able to support that, because, as you say, it teaches so much to those kids and what they're doing then goes back into their community. The, The food that they grow goes back into that community. We are speaking with Boone County Commissioner Janet Thompson. Commissioner, I remember when we talked to the Cole County Commissioners when the first round of the ARPA funding came along, they admitted they were going to the county attorney every time they turned around to see see what jived and what was eligible for funding and all. And we've now shifted to another round of that. Where are we at with all that? Is that still a still a question for the commission staff? You know, it's um, it, it has been a moving target because uh, Treasury keeps issuing uh, revised guidelines. But one of the best things, the best resources that we've had, not only our county attorney, but um, the National Association of Counties. There's a staffer there who was in the room with Treasury as they were um, working through those regulations. And she has kept us apprised of what, um, you know, of the eligibility requirements as they change. And so that's been coming down. That's a direct pipeline from NACO. So um, we've been really fortunate to have that that contact and and 
that um, guidance for, through NACO from Treasury. Thomas texted in a question. He said, you know, is there any hope to help some of the businesses that were damaged during the COVID shutdown? Well, you know, some of um, actually some of the funding that we allocated this year went to businesses. It's already done that. Um, the, For instance, the Centralia Chamber of Commerce, that was one that, you know, said, oh, my gosh, we've <laughs> We've been hit hard up here in Centralia, and um, and so that was one. So I think if there's a if there's a, a viable concern, um, then submit an application because that's that's an eligible um, expense for this for this funding. So any you had encouraged um, earlier encouraged folks to reapply if they missed out on the funding in the first round. Uh, and certainly, I'm sure you've gotten some feedback about the process. For those looking to reapply who've been through it before, are we expecting anything different about the process uh, in the second round? You know, I think the the um, the thing that's going to go much more quickly this time is the the back end of it because um, once we got the um, the awards um, at least announced, there's been some delay in getting the money out the door. For some folks, um, and that has been, you know, that's been challenging. But at this point, we have everything in place. Um, our county attorney is drafting contracts, and those should be done fairly quickly. But what what's really important about this, because it's federal funding, and because what happens if we mess up and we allocate funding to a project that is deemed um, not appropriate for ARPA, um, for instance, if we, if you all had a project and we ended up funding that and then they came back and said, oh, it's not so much, you wouldn't have to pay the money back. Boone County would have to pay the money back. And we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. We also want to make sure that um, if a project is being funded by us, that, that all of the requests for funding, if it's a, you know ongoing kind of here's the number of hours we spent or whatever, we want to make sure that all of those expenses are eligible. So we've actually contracted with a um, subrecipient monitoring organization that's doing it for several counties here in Missouri. And um, that's an important kind of check and balance on the system to make sure that all of that, all of the money that's going out is not, we're not going to get caught um, later on by, by Treasury saying, oh, you need to pay that back. Sure. Well, thank you. So that part will go a lot quicker. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Janet. Really appreciate the info. I know we've got people out here who disagree on federal funding. We're getting a lot of texts, you know, in general. But I think if that money is already, you know, set aside and available, then, you know, we want to do everything we can to help uh, Boone County get the word out. So that way uh, organizations that are interested can get their applications in. So we appreciate the update. Yeah. And and I understand people saying, you know, um, federal funding, you know, having questions about that. But as you say, if we turn it back, that means organizations in our community, that means people in our community won't get the benefit of those of those projects. And so what we're just turning back money that has been allocated to us. And um, and I know some commissions across the country have decided to turn it back. And I've gotten phone calls from people in those counties saying, can you talk to our commissioners? because we need the help. Well, we appreciate your time this morning, and we hope you keep us updated as the, that application process opens up. You bet. Thank Thanks. you so much. All right. Coming up next.
I'm Stephanie Bell, and I'm joined by producer Hannah and John Marsh and Brian Houseworth. We are getting an update um, Friday. Uh, there was a House Ethics Committee meeting. They met for four hours there in Jefferson City. Uh, the chairwoman, Hannah Kelly, um, was asked about the meeting. And officially, uh, because it involves a personnel matter, um, it's confidential what the meeting was about. But according to the Missouri Independent, which I heard someone recently refer to it as the anything but independent, <laughs> which I thought was, uh, was good. Um, but the Missouri Independent uh, said sources have confirmed that the meeting was about uh, House Speaker Dean Plocker. Of course, there was some news a few weeks ago about him wanting to purchase a new constituent management platform. And then his chief of staff was fired after that. And then more recently, there are some allegations about expense reports. Um, he seems to be in some uh, deep doo-doo the yeah. last couple of weeks. He is fighting back and saying, you know, I, he said he paid it all back. Um, but obviously it's caught the attention of the uh, committee. It's caught the attention of many candidates. Um, I think this is the uh, Andrew Koenig, who is running for state treasurer, came out. Um, I think he's the first senator to say that uh, Plocker should resign. A couple of House members said that. You know, we've heard from a lot of folks saying, you know, if he realized the mistake and paid it back, then, you know, and, and owned up to it, uh, you know, is it really that big of a deal? So you, I, I think we're seeing a debate on that issue. I We're talking to Caleb Rowden right um, at 710, and I, I intend to ask him to weigh in on that subject. But uh, we didn't find out anything really about the meeting, except that they're going to have another meeting in November. Um, and so maybe following that meeting, we will uh, learn something um, about where, uh, where that investigation is going lots of meetings that could potentially be emails <laughs> lots of meetings i don't know that these could be emails it's it's interesting and then over the weekend we found out that matthew perry died and i was honestly shocked that was unexpected he was only 54 i believe and they're saying it was an apparent drowning incident mm -hmm. and that there were no drugs found around where he passed away so and it sounds course, really bizarre yeah well and of course he struggled with addiction in the past but um obviously
Hey, I am joined by producer Hannah. Hello. And John Marsh. Good morning. And of course, Brian Houseworth is with us as well. Um, really big news in Missouri on Mizzou Homecoming. Our uh, senator in mid, one of our senators in mid Mo, uh, President Pro Tem Caleb Browden, announced he was going to run for Secretary of State. And it has been fireworks since then. There's been a lot um, involving uh, elections and some stuff going on with the House Speaker. And so a lot to weigh in on. He was on Fred Perry's show, CEO Roundtable. Brian has posted that to the website. Yes. Um, and of course, you can check out the Eagle app if you want to um, check that long form interview. I listened to it and learned a lot. It was so a good interview. You should check that out. Um, S- Senator Rowden, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Yeah, good to have you. So, uh, first of all, um, there's some new stuff out yesterday that I saw on Twitter about the ERIC program. Um, and specifically that involves the Secretary of State's office. Have you seen these tweets and is there any is there any truth to them? Um, essentially, I think the allegation is that we were sh- briefly enrolled in Eric um, and somehow Eric was sharing our data with China. Yeah, yeah well, I can't speak to uh, you know whether or not that is true or not. Um, I, I think we've done some pretty extensive research and, and the team is doing more research on. Uh, Eric, uh, and, uh, you know, I think the broader conversation is, is uh, you know, data privacy and data protection. I think we, we've tried to, in the legislature, we've tried to be diligent about um, not being irresponsible, but also being very, very intentional about making sure that, you know, Missourians' data is protected and, and the, the, the privacy element is there. Uh, you know, so we, we've, we've done that in the legislature, I think, you know, if, if I'm fortunate enough to move up. Uh, and move on in the Secretary of State's role, I think would be even, you know, there, there's there's a, an additional kind of level of scrutiny and diligence that has to happen. Uh, the, the, the amount of data, not just election data, uh, but other types of data that, that uh, are relevant to the Secretary of State and their interaction with uh, the people of Missouri, I think is really, really important. So we're going to do it. We're going to be intentional about that. You know, I think it's it's um, we're, we're not going to go down. Um, we're not going to go down roads that we don't need to, but we're also going to be very, very uh, serious about making sure that the, that the data, data privacy of, of Missourians is protected. Senator, we appreciate you joining us. I did post the full interview with you and Fred Perry from uh, over the weekend, 93.9theeagle.com. You talked about term limits. You talked about your run for Secretary of State. Lots of good good issues. I mean, there were about 10 or 15 literally things I could, could have pulled sound bites from uh, that were on there. But at the end of the interview, you slammed Senator Hoskins saying that he essentially killed the gaming bill because he wanted the slot machines in gas stations. And he did respond to me last night. And it's uh, three sentences, but I'm going to read his response to you because I'd like you to respond. He's basically disagreeing with what you said. He said the Missouri Constitution, quote, says state tax revenue from gaming must be used for education and veterans. And currently, that tax revenue does not fully fund our veterans' homes and cemeteries. As a veteran of the Missouri Army National Guard, I will continue to find a dedicated funding source for our veterans' homes and cemeteries. Unfortunately, comma, as a former pop singer, Rowden's loyalties lie with getting the best deal for casinos, not the best deal for Missouri veterans and taxpayers, end of quote. Essentially there, he's saying you're carrying the water for casino. Senator, your response. <laughs> I, I'm curious if he's trying to make a connection between a Christian musician and a, and a casino. That's an interesting <laughs> uh that's an interesting political play. Uh, no, I mean, look, you ask anybody. I mean, literally anybody. You don't have to ask me. You could ask anybody that uh, is involved in uh, Missouri politics, any any of the other probably 32 uh, members of the legislature of the Senate um, and, and most of the members of the House. Um, Senator Hoskins is solely responsible for this. It's, it's, the, it's the bet he's made. He's got to lay in it. I, I'm, I, I mean, it's you know, he, he found, um, you know, uh, an ally that was willing to, to fund his campaigns uh, in, in the VLT folks. Uh, and and he's, he's been loyal to him, I think. Uh, but he's going to have to realize he's been loyal at the expense of a whole host of people who are who are less interested in slot machines and gas stations and more interested in just being able to do, in some cases, what they've already been doing for a long time, just to be able to do it legally. So, um, you know, revisionist history doesn't work. Uh, he knows it. I mean, I, I don't have to it's not going to be, I don't have to, I don't have to do anything to win that fight. Um, everybody else will win the fight for me. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator. Senator, talk to us about something you've worked on. Gosh, I think maybe almost a year ago when we talked to you about your priorities for the past session coming up, 
was what the heck was going to happen with initiative petition reform and also critical race theory. Yeah, you know, IP reform is an ongoing discussion. Uh, we got, uh, as is the case, a number of different uh, ways and, 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 and a lot of different issues. Uh, we, we passed a bill out of the Senate. The House passed a different version uh, last year on IP reform, uh, kind of some back and forth between just a simple raising of the, the threshold uh, for a constitutional amendment versus uh, this somewhat new idea of some sort of concurrent majority you have to get uh, you know, five of eight congressional districts or a majority of the House districts or, or you know, a, a different metric uh, to, uh, you know, maybe incentivize rural Missouri to be a little bit more engaged. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think the variables have changed all that much on IP. Um, you know, we still have the same. that the, the Dems still don't want any changes. I think Republicans have to figure out uh, what changes they do want and, and get in a little bit more, um, find a little a little more consensus before, uh, you know, finding a path to the end there. Uh, you know, CRT, we've, we worked on last year, uh, passed a bill that, that did some good. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that we're going to keep looking at. Um, you know, not, not every school in the state uh, or not every teacher in the state, far from it, are uh, engaging in, in trying to indoctrinate kids in this way. But there are some that are doing it. There's some school districts that are being intentional about it. And I think we should Find find any anything that we can do, including uh, you know the, the the control of the purse strings, uh, to make sure that we're educating kids and not not brainwashing them. Something you shared on Fred Perry's uh, show was you said when contemplating uh, running for Secretary of State, you talked to Senator Blunt, and he said that that was his favorite office. Why do you yeah. th- why do you think that is, and what drew what draws you to that particular office? Yeah, I think uh, you know part of it is probably what drew Senator Blunt. I mean, you know, he's a, he's a he's a ser- he's a serious person. He's, he he was a serious public servant. Um, you know, I think the the I was less uh, one. I wasn't one hundred percent sure I wanted to do this. Uh, uh, you know, being in Senate leadership for six years, you you take on some battle wounds that uh, maybe you want to push you the other direction. But uh, you know, we were thinking about thinking about just continuing to serve and what wh- where where we could do that. I I, I think I was less. Um, enamored with trying to find the path of, of political least resistance, right? You know, a, a, a seat that you can uh, walk into, et cetera, and just trying to find one that, hey, if I'm going to keep doing this, if I'm going to keep serving the people of the state in some capacity, uh, you know, I'd like to do it uh, in, in a serious and functional way. And I think the, uh, the Secretary of State's office is the is the best place for that. You know, the the, the um, depth and breadth of, of, of all of the various ways that that office uh, interacts with Missourians. And, and I think there's a lot of things we can do. And we're already putting a plan together, um, you know, to, to really be intentional about communicating, okay, you know, this is, this is maybe how your interactions with that office have been in the past. Here's what we want to do to improve it, uh, whether it's the business business side, the library side, the election side, uh, securities, and, and a whole host of things in between. So, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a real job, you know, it's not, it's not a, a fluffy um <laughs> Kind of statewide position. There's, there's a, a big. You can, staff na- and... you can name the fluffy statewide positions, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the lieutenant governor has can pretty much do whatever they want, and right. I will say, lieutenant governor Ke- Kehoe has turned that role into, uh, you know, quite a robust office. But yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's really what drew us to it. I, it just was, it was. Uh, if I'm going to keep doing this, if I'm going to, uh, you know, continue on in this path, we we want it to be real. We want it to be effective, and we want it to benefit the people of Missouri, and that's just, this is where we thought we could do it. So that role, uh, the current Secretary of State, Jay Ashcroft, has received some criticism from legislators, I think mainly Democrat legislators, about his uh, a- activity in the legislature. He had come over and testified on some bills and is pretty active as far as having a legislative agenda. Do you, How do you plan to, you know, if elected, uh, you know, do you plan to be as involved? Or are you going to scale that back? What's your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, I, I think we can be a little bit more essential. Jay, Secretary of State Ashcroft is running for governor. Everybody knows that. And so I think there's an element of, of politics involved with most of this. I don't I, I don't think I'm breaking any news there. I mean, I think that one of the things that is, is was and is intriguing to me about the Secretary of State's role is is it is it is a, a, a call balls and strikes office a lot of the time. It doesn't mean that uh, you don't you don't use um, your or you don't have principles. It doesn't mean that you don't. Uh, put those principles to use in in <clears throat> some ways, but yeah, I think we'll be a little bit more intentional about you know I I, I I'm I, I'm a senator now I've been a legislator now will will have been for 12 years I don't necessarily love it when um, you know other folks who aren't 
intimately involved in in the the conversations come in and 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 try to bigfoot us so i think we'll probably be a little bit more intentional about that because i've been on the other side of it and i understand that but we're going to use the the office uh you know i think again in a way that it best serves the people of missouri and if that means we uh you know take a leading role and and try to get something through the legislature certainly we'll we'll do that but we'll do it more as a partnership and not not sort of as a bludgeoning into submission you know sort of situation now the house ethics committee met friday um and it has been suggested that it was related to the recent allegations against dean plocker any comments i know your uh colleague i believe senator koenig weighed in and said he should resign um what are your thoughts on it yeah you know i i think um uh Dean's a friend of mine, and and I, I think certainly mistakes were made. I think he would admit mistakes were made. I think there's there is a process that is in place in the House um, that that uh, is a bipartisan process that that I you know maybe I don't know exactly what that uh, ethics committee talked about. Obviously, most of it was behind closed doors, but uh, you know th- there's a process in place that would uh, allow that pro- that um, you know sort of situation to to get to its conclusion. I think in a natural way. So. Um, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to weigh in too much other than to say, you know, I think he knows he made mistakes. It seems pretty evident that um, that, uh, that that's the case and, and that the House is going to do what they're going to do. And then the conclusion is going to be what it's going to be. But that, I think, you know, the resignation is up to, to, to Speaker Parker and, and the members of the House caucus. All right. Well, coming up this week, you've got the Senate caucus. What uh, what goes on at that meeting and what do you expect uh, to come out of it? Yeah, it's always a good time. You know, we have, uh, uh, you know, usually have pretty, it's pretty well attended down in Branson. Um, you know, we have a good time, break bread together. And um, we really just try to figure out, okay, this is this is a new year. Uh, all of the the um, uh, perils and, and turmoils of the year prior, uh, you know, are gone, at least for the moment. We have a chance to, um, you know, to, to, to write a new story and figure out how, what we can do to, to, to pass you know, really a really strong conservative agenda. So we'll talk about that. I think, you know, the, I think a lot of people know what the priorities are. Um, you know, some of them we were able to get done in the last couple of years. Some are, are still uh, hanging out there and we've got some work to do. But I think part of it is just, uh, you know, the relational component of, of, of um, serving the legislature, serving in a caucus together and accomplishing things is really, really important. Um, you know, and there's a lot of members of our caucus, I think, who work hard to get uh, the relational component right so they can build the trust, um, you know, to, to be able to ask, hey, will you will you come on board with the thing that I'm doing? Um, you know, I think there's folks who take a different approach, which which is just, um, you know, full frontal assault and, and warfare. Um, so we, we, we try to we try to get those relationships as, uh, as as good as they can be, as strong as they can be heading into January. And we'll talk priorities and hopefully we'll come out of there united and, and ready to do some good for the people of Missouri. We will hope that for for you as well. Uh, thanks so much for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. All right. Coming up next, it's going to be What's Hot with Hannah. Hannah, what do you got for us this morning? A very special kind of DMV Ooh. that might be really great or really bad. Awesome. That's up next on Wake Up in Missouri.
is sorry. 725 ish, <laughs> which means it's it's actually 726. Close. But I will share the blame on that because I forgot to have my little hot 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 pulled up. Um the DMV. There are truly fewer places in this world that I would rather go than the DMV. I refuse to go really. Do you if just, I can do you just a, make the husband do it? I do. It's man duty. <laughs> man duty? That's a blue job? <laughs> yep. Have we talked about pink and blue jobs on the show before? I'm not sure. Maybe we'll have to touch on that later. Um, but the DMV is almost always a terrible experience. I know there's a hidden gym in Jefferson City. In the Truman Building, they have one there, and it's usually really good. And Stephanie doesn't like to share that one because she doesn't want too many people to know about it. I like to gatekeep that secret. <laughs> and you can do it online. Yeah, yeah A lot of it. Yeah, and depending. online. Um, the state of Illinois is introducing a new type of DMV that is for one specific type of person, but it might actually help the rest of us out in the process. Like new drivers? It is not new drivers. It is actually very experienced drivers. They are opening a elderly folks only DMV center. What? And it is a full service DMV, but it specializes in dealing with elderly folks. And it's sort of like a skip the line type of place. Um, They accept walk-ins. And Stephanie, I don't know if you've ever been at the DMV and you're behind an older person. And I know they can't help it, bless their hearts. But sometimes it, they're just, it takes them a long time to figure out what they're trying to do. Or maybe they're like writing out a check. Yeah, and maybe they need a little more guidance than... That's me, I write checks still. Oh, well... I don't even own checks. I should probably fix that. Um, But it's just, it's a service where they can give the seniors a little more one-on-one, you know, help them with step-by-step instructions. If they need to retake their driver's test, they can do that there. Um, And I think that this is something that maybe Missouri should look into. Our friends over in Illinois are trying it out. I guess we can see how they fare. I don't fare. know that we want to copy Illinois, but this, <laughs> well, yeah. this does kind of sound like a good idea. And I know when we were talking about the uh, the airplanes making changes to the way they board people, and they're like, just board all the window seats first, which, you know, logically makes sense. But in another study, they said, really, that's not going to help that much. What you have to do is separate the slow boarders from the fast boarders. And that sounds like what Illinois is doing is saying, hey, these people are generally a little bit slower slower in getting the process done so let's put them over here and it probably decreases your frustration Hmm. standing in line um if you maybe they could designate one specific day or something in the week for folks over a certain age i've seen a lot of stores especially since covid they kind of do like early bird hours yeah they did you know grocery stores um iv did that yeah seniors can go shop before it opens for everybody else so maybe we're on to something maybe we are well you
are calling the action Farmageddon and may also protest outside stores across the country from Monday to Wednesday. They're demanding better working conditions, including guaranteed hours and better pay for technicians. This is Wake Up Mid-Missouri. So if you are headed out the door this morning, you're going to want to do two things. You're going to want to wear a coat. The high for today is only 41, and it's going to be a cold, cold Halloween. It's a little, little brisk. Cold Halloween tomorrow. Um, but you're also going to want to probably check the list if you're going to fill a prescription and make and because there are certain pharmacies that are on this walkout list. Again, there's 2,000. And can we get some points for Pharmageddon? It's a pretty sweet Yeah, name. I like that. <laughs> but there are... <laughs> 2,000 folks that are planning to uh, walk out. Um, we're getting some texts this morning from Ray. Ray's way, weighing in, and she said it's not just about pay. That's what the companies are trying to make about, but it's about working conditions and, uh, and a lot of staffing considerations. They're saying the margins are actually higher on vaccines, and now, um, you know, they used to just have to do a bunch of vaccines during flu season, but now they're being asked to do vaccines all during <clears throat> for these uh, COVID boosters. And that is, uh, and they're being encouraged to do the vaccines, but then they're having to step away from actually filling folks' prescriptions. And there are some pharmacies where they're a week back on filling prescriptions. I know the last time we had uh, Jefferson City Mayor Ron Fitzwater on, who happens to be the lobbyist from the Missouri Pharmacy Association, he talked about all the hoops they have to jump through and all the time they burn up and effort on the reimbursements and all the paperwork that pharmacies have to do that just adds to the workload and yeah and they're short staffed anyway just like all industries and so the workers are saying look you know when other people uh make mistakes we like to say on the show you know we're, good thing we're not uh doing brain surgery here <laughs> um if we make a mistake and real good <laughs> right uh but the pharmacists are saying look if we make a mistake if we're distracted if i'm having to go do vaccines if i'm having to do all this paperwork like you said john then you know it's you know a decimal point here a typo here you know if i get the instructions wrong i mean it is sometimes a matter of life or death but and then you think about people who i, I mean i'm guilty i wait till the very last minute my pharmacists who Same. I know some of my pharmacists listen um and I call like the day that it's it's out and I'm like oh guess what I need some surprise <laughs> refill and they're like is this important medicine I'm like it really is and um and so I can't imagine if they told me well you couldn't have it for a week um and and my medicine isn't life or death but it's um it certainly helps you feel good but um but some of these people i mean that is that's terrifying that you would show up and they'd say well we're a week back just uh hang on there for a minute well and i'm also thinking we're headed into like cold and flu season you know i know several folks who've been battling colds as the temperature has changed and i'm thinking what terrible timing it really yeah no it's not great timing and then i, I also think who's not on strike us good point <laughs> I mean, us right well maybe uh, Yes, we're not on strike, but the, let's see. They've said the hospitality workers. I think I heard a rumor that like maybe they were going to strike in Las Vegas. We've had um, the obviously the auto workers. We've got all the stuff going on with the actors and the writers. I mean, and so we talked earlier this morning, and I want to get to this crazy story from Jefferson City over the weekend, but about you know how we're sending messages. And I think you know I think the last I saw was this auto worker strike. I mean, they are getting a huge increase in pay, and didn't some of the delivery services they just got that after they we're on strike. So I'm thinking, you know, are we encouraging people by bending to the demands of some of these unions? They see other people doing it. And so they're like, well, uh, it worked for them. So why it's going to work for me? I mean, do you think that's it, John? I think you're on the money. I, I don't think this is a good situation. For maybe us to maybe be going the down. Uh, dispensary workers in Columbia will try it again. Right? Yeah, there's another one. <laughs> I mean, it seems like who I mean, literally, I think radio uh, radio folks are the only people who haven't been on strike this week, this year. I mean, at least been, that we know of. At least that we know of. That's right. We're not unionized here. We are not. Well, and you, so what kind of messages are we sending people? And some people got a pretty serious message this week in Jefferson City. And I can't say that I've like laughed out loud after reading a police press release in a long time. But the one that Jeff City put out this weekend, it was, it was really good. This is almost as good as the chocolate milk <laughs> incident oh, yes. that happened a few weeks ago <laughs> i guess yeah I, I see some parallels there this was a deal uh, on saturday afternoon the police went to the ulta cosmetic store on missouri boulevard and uh, the, the guy who called them out there said two women left the store and jumped in a car with big bags of stolen items took off across the bridge uh, into callaway county callaway county deputies threw out the spike strips and 
ultimately stopped the car. A couple of them bailed out, had to chase him down with the dog and all that stuff and caught him. But I think it kind of sent a loud message about, you know, this isn't uh, Southern California and the the woke non-response to shoplifting. Not only are we going to, you know, find you, but we're, we'll throw the spike strips down over some makeup. So we are serious <laughs> here in <laughs> Missouri, which I really appreciate, honestly. I mean, some of these, we know how many businesses have been forced to close because no, they're not getting any help in prosecuting these thefts. And it not only it costs the rest of us money, um, but and it's, you know, uh, it drains the resources of these businesses that they're just closing and and that's, i guess if there was any upside to this story might be that they looked really great for their mug shots <laughs> <laughs> i still find it hilarious though that three folks were arrested but only two of them ran when they ultimately got stopped by the spike strips so i'm thinking the third person just knew that they weren't gonna make it on foot they just sat there and accepted their fate i guess well the, the other one yes yeah, yeah the in the the guy involved is facing a bunch of charges, including, as Brian pointed out earlier, possession of a firearm by a felon. And driving while suspended. And he I think he was the getaway car driver. So it's like, Sounds girls, like you got to yeah. get resisting a... Resisting arrest, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Next time, get a getaway driver that has a license and isn't a felon, maybe. Um, but yeah, so they charged all three of these people, put out a press release. It kind of went locally viral and people are like, yeah, let's get these folks. Um, and I'm hoping it... it the press release does say all three folks are from St. Louis, Missouri. And so it's, yeah, you can't bring that California stuff or that even that St. Louis stuff to Midmo. We are going to we are going to find you and you are going to get in trouble. Well, and I don't know about this makeup store in particular, but I've heard lots of these big department stores. They train their employees to essentially not try to stop shoplifters have you seen this yeah no i have friends that work in in stores and they say do not touch these people you you know and don't don't follow them out and actually some people have been charged when they have tried to basically recover their things or follow these people out yeah get assault charges on them Mm -hmm. i mean if we've heard about it i'm sure there's bad guys out there that are hearing this and going i could basically walk in and waltz out with as much product as i want that to me is crazy it is, and that's the message that I think people have have been getting uh, from other states and from, I think, more urban areas, and I'm glad uh, this weekend that we are sending folks a different message. Well, over the weekend, um, over the weekend, we got some big news. Uh, Mike Pence dropped out of the race. I'm actually shocked by this news. Hannah? Yeah, I am not surprised that he's dropping out, but the timing that he's dropping out, you know, it's very early in the race still and yeah. i would have thought his ego would have prevented him from dropping out until the last minute so i was yeah john were you shocked hearing the news yeah well i was surprised by hearing the news and i kind of track along with what hannah says you know maybe down the road sure but uh kind of early on in the thing being the former you know former vice president and all that he would bail out but maybe and pay me the pollsters know better than we do. I'm trying to remember, was he the first person to essentially announce? I mean, he's been in it, you know, for so long and folks that have gotten in after him. So his real clear polling average was just three and a half percent. He was even being beat by Ramaswamy, who, you know, got into the race and is a relatively newcomer to politics. Which good, because Pence has been such a jerk to Ramaswamy. He really <laughs> has. But that's like if you're the former vice president, I mean, you've got crazy name ID. You know, you should have the wind behind you and you're three and a half percent is kind of embarrassing right but he positioned so negatively with the ever truppers going back to the things at the capitol and you know when the electoral college vote and all that stuff that boy oh boy i think that handwriting was on the wall from the get-go it really was well there's been some talk too about this um ballot in new hampshire i think joe biden is not actually going to appear on the ballot and he you're going to have to write his name in if you live there but i was looking at um, the numbers and there's actually even with the dropouts there's supposed to be 24 republicans on that primary ballot and 21 democrats now in missouri we actually eliminated our uh presidential primary vote and we're going to go back to the caucus system and we are working with uh working on getting someone from the missouri gop here on the show to talk to us about those important dates what you're going to need to know how it's different um and so i'm looking forward to that but i can't who are these other 24 people that are on the ballot in New Hampshire? That's what I really want to know. Yeah, and who's next in dropping out? 
Yeah, well, that's a really good question. I don't think Haley drops out. She's actually real clear shows her, you know, kind of surging and getting some momentum. I, she's got, uh, let's see, 12. No, that's DeSantis. DeSantis has 12, but Haley has three or sorry, eight percentage points. And that's that's pretty good. And she's performed, I think, well in the debate. So I don't see, honestly, of these top, what are we down to four candidates? Um, Trump, DeSantis, Haley, Ramaswamy, I think they're all in it for the long haul. Well, and Haley <laughs> is leaning more towards the center, maybe in that libertarian camp when it comes to abortion. And I think that that's going to gain a lot of traction with younger voters. Um, I've seen several clips of hers go viral on TikTok. Of, and there's people in the comments, which usually on TikTok, it's you know not exactly a conservative-friendly platform. Mm-hmm. But lots of people in the comments on these videos going, you know, I don't typically support conservative candidates, but I like this girl. I kind of like her on that. Well, we are going to be talking to Frank Catanzaro. He's the chairman of the Missouri Young Republicans. And that's something I want to ask him about. Our people, because initially, Vivek Ramaswamy, how old is he again? He's like 30, 30, well, he's younger than me. 34? Yeah. 37? We'll have to to fact check ourselves on that. But I thought they would all be all in for him. But I I suspect a lot of them are still all in for Trump. But it's uh, Ben Carson uh, also this this weekend endorsed Trump and had some like Instagram posts about it. I, does anyone care about Ben Carson or endorsements? He's all been off the radar for a long time. I know. Yeah. I thought it's weird that he would be making such a big deal out of coming in and endorsing Trump. But I do think we'll see more people uh, endorsing Trump as we go forward. Um, it's really I just I'm 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 tired of these other folks weighing in like it's time for a new era we've got a lot of people weighing in on the spending debate we were asking thomas massey uh in congress tweeted out something and said hey i'm you know i took a poll and none of my constituents or the people that i polled um are in favor of any funding for any um other countries and he said you know so what are your thoughts are you all in for fun you know no funding to anybody uh or do you think there should be funding just for israel or just for ukraine and all of his people said no funding uh, for anybody. And he said that's how he intends to vote. I thought in mid-Missouri that it would be split, um, but we're getting a lot of texts at 573-874-9390. And a lot of folks are saying, yeah, he's right, no funding for anybody. Um, And so that appears to be where our folks are too. Um, We expect that issue to come up in Congress.
Lighting up about foreign aid. Adam is saying, keep our money here. Stop funding perpetual war. Catherine says, I like to pick my charitable contributions. And our friend, I think it was Brad, gave me a chuckle when he said, when I was reading that uh, story about the Jeff City police <laughs> nabbing those guys he, or women, he said, uh, you know, there's a Jason Aldean song that uh, comes to mind. You know, maybe they shouldn't have uh, tried that in a small town. So that was good. <laughs> that was really good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so coming up, uh, we've got uh, and that would be all except for this. OK, we've got some Halloween. And that would be all. Except for this. Offsides. <laughs> First down. Kid came to my door a few years back. They said wearing a shirt full of small cereal boxes with knives sticking out the side of each of the box. I asked him what he was supposed to be, and he replied, Are you stupid or something? I'm a cereal killer. Love it. Went to a party where three people dressed up like David Hasselhoff from Baywatch. At one point, someone fell into the pool and all the Hasselhoffs jumped in to save him. Let's see. Doorbell made our Great Dane nervous on Halloween, so we gave him some vet-prescribed puppy Xanax to relax for the night. But he was so stoned, at one point he walked out the front door and peed on a kid's dad. <laughs> and, and finally, Mom did a full witch costume, green face and all. The smart Alec neighbor asked, finally dressed as your true self, I see. She said, no, I modeled it off your wife's wedding photos Ooh. and says, we don't speak with them anymore. Now you know the rest of that story. Wow. I'm wondering what everyone's <laughs> Halloween costumes, how many Travis Kelsey's and Taylor Swift's did you see this last weekend? I was just getting ready to say the same thing. I'm sure that will be one of the top couples costumes of this year. I s- yeah. Zombie Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. Right? I still really want a picture of someone dressed as Bob Menendez with like some Mercedes keys and a jacket full of gold. Um, <laughs> I just think <laughs> somebody, somebody's got to do it, right? Did you see my Halloween costume, Hannah? I was going to ask you. I saw some great pictures of the kiddos oh, and your yes. husband had an interesting <laughs> get up on. So, it was slightly disturbing. <laughs> But it, it is slightly disturbing. So my my girls made a deal with my with uh, with my husband and, and also with me and I they went and ran the a 5K in their costumes this weekend. Um, but the girls agreed that they really wanted to go as old ladies. And they've come up. They they tried to think of old lady what they call old lady names that they refer to each other as. I what they pick? One is Linda. Which I think okay. fits. Yeah. And then I think. But Karen. <laughs> right, Karen. They went with, uh, I think, Linda and Rita for a while. Um, <laughs> and so You have the funniest kids. It is hilarious. They've got these crazy wigs and pearls and canes, and they got like a little cardigan and a little floral dress. Um, I think they actually won like an award uh, for a costume. So, but they their deal was we will do the old lady thing, but mom and dad, you have to dress up as babies or kids. Oh, so, your husband fully embraced it. So Chris Bell had on like a um, a nude bodysuit <laughs> with a cloth diaper and like a, a weird pacifier. Um, so uh, you know, it's your kids. You got to do what it. What a good sport, right? I think I I have something planned. So maybe we'll take a full Halloween picture tomorrow. But of course. Um, it, my costume will likely be covered up by a full-on winter coat tomorrow night because it is going to be <laughs> rather chilly. That was always the worst as a kid when your mom would make you bundle up underneath your Halloween costume and it would totally ruin your costume. My girl, What are you supposed to be, little girl? <laughs> the Michelin man. <laughs> yeah. My girls were definitely wearing, like, uh, long johns under their costumes. <laughs> now, do you Saturday think your morning. girls will wear these costumes until after the holidays? Oh, I yeah, oh yes. They, <laughs> they put them on almost every day and then do these little bits around the house about what it was like back in their day when, they, when we didn't have no iPhones. That's what Amelia likes to say. So. I was going to say, what is their version <laughs> of the Dark Ages? What do they think it was? Oh, goodness. It is hilarious.
Missouri. I am joined by producer Hannah. Hello. And John Marsh. Good morning. And of course, Brian Houseworth. We're getting a lot of folks weighing in on the JCPD story, and it's hilarious. They said, yeah, try that in a small town, <laughs> um, which I am loving this morning. Uh, I'm really excited to welcome in this morning. You have heard him on our program before. Frank Catanzaro, he is the chairman of the um, Missouri Young Republicans. So, um, Frank, I want to ask you first, Hannah reminded me of this. You had, there was a St. Louis Young Republicans, I think it was an event, like a barbecue here recently, and there was some pretty intense sparring by some of the candidates. Did you witness all of that? I, I did. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me on. Good morning. How was that received? Uh, yeah, so... Uh... So along with running the Young Republican Organization for the state of Missouri, I actually run our St. Louis chapter. And uh, we had a huge barbecue we do every year. It's called the Freedom Fest Barbecue. We had it uh, first weekend in October. And, and like you said, Stephanie, there was a little bit of uh, sparring between a couple of our speakers, and that would be uh, Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft and State Senator Bill Eigel, both vying for governor. They kind of did some some heated jabs at one another and – the, uh, at one point, it just kept going on and on. Uh, I think Senator Igo was, was talking about the foreign, uh, the foreign owned land ownership legislation that was pretty contentious in last year's legislative session. And, uh, Senator Igo was kind of poking at Jay Ashcroft and they were kind of going back with each other. And at one point, the audience even engaged and started heckling, uh, Senator Igo. <laughs> so it got a little heated and we had to, we had to lower the temperature a bit at the event. That's always kind of nerve wracking when your when your event starts to go off the rails for those that are involved in the planning. But it sounds like you had a good turnout. If you could, can you tell us about kind of the state of the membership? I think you I think I am officially now aged out. Um, but I know, yeah. uh, you know, I've seen you do some other interviews and you talked about how you've been able to increase membership or that was one of your goals. You know, what's the membership looking like and what are you guys doing to try to draw in younger members? Sure, sure. We're always trying to get more young people engaged with the Republican Party um, as an extension of the Republican Party, the Young Republican Organization. We're all around the country. And here in Missouri specifically, we have six individual chapters across the state, um, St. Louis being our largest uh, in the state, followed by Kansas City. We have some in Springfield, uh, Jefferson City, St. Charles, Sedalia. And we're looking at some newer locations around the state of starting new chapters. Um, overall, we have about 150 members statewide. Um, when I when I took over um, the organization, we uh, we've actually increased that number about 10 percent since February. So, with an overall goal of um, doubling our existing chapters, trying to ensure we get more members out, our goal is to continue to grow and get more young people engaged. So, what is the role of that chapter? We heard, you know, your St. Louis chapter just had this big event. What are the other chapters doing? Sure, sure. So the overall goal of the organization is to get more young people engaged. Um, we want to recruit, train, and elect the next generation of Republican leaders. So whether you want to just be more engaged on who you're going to vote for, um, whether you want to work or volunteer on a campaign, or you might even want to run for office yourself, uh, the young Republicans want to be that, that tool that you can utilize to become more engaged and, and make a difference. So how are you reaching people? Is it mainly our are, are, like are young people they do they really want to go to an in-person event or are you mainly reaching them through social channels for for us older republicans who are wanting maybe also to reach the younger people how how do we do that sure sure so it's a combination of both so we hold we hold local events at our individual chapter levels um just kind of like i'd mentioned before the the barbecue that we had a few weeks ago we had over 150 people there uh, you know, the, the age group varied between, you know, young Republican age, which is 18 to 40, all the way up to the pachyderms in their 90s. So um, trying to get people more engaged. We'll do the local events. We have monthly meetings where we bring in speakers. We have uh, happy hour events where people can just mingle, talk about the issues on their mind with other fellow young Republicans. And those events are held at these individual chapters all throughout the state. Wonderful. Um, all right. So we are speaking with Frank Catanzaro. He's the chairman of the Missouri Young Republicans. Frank, last time you were on with us, I think we had Mark Ellinger from Ellinger Bell in studio with us. And you talked about the ACE Act and all. We haven't heard much about that lately. But where does your membership come down on that whole idea as far as election security goes? 
You know, election security is probably the utmost, one of the most important issues, I think, to, to all voters, especially to our members. If we don't have secure elections, we're not, we're not a good democratic republic. So we're always paying attention to the issues at hand, especially at the state level. Our, our state is probably more secure than some other states are throughout the country, but there's always ways to improve that. So we're always kind of looking at new ways to ensure that we have election integrity. I think that really matters. Now, we saw Mike Pence um, drop out of the race this weekend. And I, you know, I don't think all young people are just like, well, I'm going to support the young guy. I'm going to support Vivek. But we see a little bit of that, um, some energy among younger Republicans for him. Um, But where what are you hearing? Where are your members at as far as the 2024 race? Are they still you know, all are they all in for Trump? Are they potentially open to someone else? Hannah was saying earlier that I think um, she's seeing a lot of social media interaction for Nikki Haley. Yeah, yeah, I would say, you know, the our membership kind of is all over the place. We actually did a straw poll. We had our young Republican national conference. This was young Republicans from all throughout the country. We all came together in early August in Dallas to elect a new national board. And there were over a thousand young Republicans there from all throughout the country. And we did a straw poll and the straw poll indicated. uh, So at the time it was uh, Ron DeSantis came in first, but only by a couple percentage more than Donald Trump. So it was still very close. And I believe it was followed by either Nikki Haley and, and maybe Vivek Ramaswamy at the time. So there's still, you know, young young people are still trying to figure out which is the right candidate. There's obviously a lot of support for the former president. Um, and at the time, there was some support for Governor DeSantis. But it's it's been a few months since we kind of gauged the interest of our members. And it'll be interesting to see after next week's debate kind of where those members uh, choose to kind of go to. Certainly. We've got a text from Jackie that's at 573-874-9390. And she um, said, as a former YR president, um, she wants to know about young women and their role in leading either the states or chapter level uh, in leadership. Sure. Yeah, I mean, our organization, um, that's one of our top priorities to get not only just more young people, but we want to get more more women and minority individuals involved with the organization. You know, our, our Republican Party is growing and changing in great ways. And um, I believe now more than ever, there are more women elected to Congress. I think we have more women than ever elected in the uh, state general assembly. Um, and we need more women running for statewide office as, as well as uh, we have, you know, we have a presidential candidate, Nikki Haley. So um, always looking to get people more involved. And that's one of our top priorities. Do you have women chapter leaders and, and on your board now? Was the last president a, a woman, right? Yeah, our last chairman, uh, her name was Mary Catherine. She actually was uh, she was my predecessor. She still serves on a, on a board role here in St. Louis with me as well as on our state board. Um, most of our state chapters have women on our boards. Women have led uh, our state chapter, or I'm sorry, our uh, chapter here in St. Louis uh, numerous times over the years, especially when I've been involved. Um, my predecessor actually was a woman. Nice. Well, so if I am um, in, if I meet the age requirements, I think the only person who does that is producer Hannah right now. <laughs> Um, or maybe I maybe I'm listening and I have a kid who meets the age requirements and they've been talking to me about politics. And I think this is a good group, you know, that I want to send them to to try to get them involved. Where do we find out more information about the young Republicans? Sure, sure. So if you want to go on, we're actually on Facebook right now at Missouri Young Republicans. We're about to launch a new website at the end of the year. But right now, just check us out on Facebook, Missouri Young Republicans. Find out which chapter is closest to you. And we'll get you connected between the ages of 18 and 40. Wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us, Frank. Well, thanks for having me, guys. All right. Well, uh, coming up, we are hearing that um, Secretary of State Ashcroft is on his way.
introducing a new way to pay. And I'm not sure. I'm usually all about the latest tech. Like I'm I'm an early adopter. I really like the latest tech, but I'm I'm still maybe just going to write a check, I think. I don't know that I'm down for this. And it's it surprises me because I have uh given my information out in so many different ways that this one <laughs> feels particularly <laughs> offensive. But Amazon has this new thing called Amazon One, and rather than um, tapping your card or, you know, paying with your Apple wallet or whatever, um, apparently it just scans your palm. Do you, Like, would you do that, Hannah? Um, I don't know. It feels like giving them your fingerprints, right? Yeah. I am surprised that that's a thing, and Amazon's doing it? Yes, they How are. are they? So I'm thinking logistically, Amazon being an online service, how are they scanning your palm? Well, they have partnerships with people like Whole Foods. So okay. it's in person. So when you go to like the self-checkout or wherever that Amazon is at, you can, um, but they basically run that service and you hold your hand up and it just takes a picture of the of your palm and it knows and that's how you pay. I don't, I can't. That doesn't seem like do it. it could be very accurate either. I mean, fingerprinting. Sort of like the retinal scans and then opening your smartphone with your fingerprint. Same and, kind of deal, I guess. And that's what I was thinking, John, because I, I'm a sucker for skipping the line at the airport. And I always, so I do clear, and I know a lot of other people, and you can choose, I think, to do your eyes or maybe a fingerprint. And so I chose eyes. So I go to the airport. If they have clear, I look into the camera. They look in my eyeballs and they know that it's me and it still feels weird, but I like cost benefit. I get to skip the line. So I'm like, I'm going <laughs> to do it. But at the same time, and people have asked us, you know, how did clear because it's a third party contractor? How did they get the monopoly on this, you know, skip the line service at at airports? And I think yeah. that's a really good question. But also, you know, how secure is your data at, you know, with this third party and how secure is your data if you're giving it to the government? So I, I just or TikTok. Yeah. But I just I don't know that I don't know that people are ready to say, oh, yeah, my my hand works as a wallet and connecting, you know, every all of your bank accounts or I, I assume you can connect credit cards are connected to your palm. I know people almost like using the same password for every account or something. <laughs> right. Well, and I know people were freaked out when they first started doing like pay with your watch or pay with your phone. Like, could I accidentally, you know, tap something and pay for something because it's, you know, all basically Bluetooth. And so there was a lot, I think, of pushback against using your Apple wallet and tap to pay and all of that. And now it's kind of, you know, industry standard, although the machines never quite work how they're supposed to work because you're tapping and then they're like, now you have to swipe. And you're like, I did swipe. And then they're like, tap it again. You know, so I wonder <laughs> how well the palm scanning yep. works. But it is, um, I, I just, I don't think I can get on board with that. And I'm wondering how fast, you know, if anyone is going to sign up for this service. I just, Well, what's next? They're just going to chip us like the dog at the vet, right? I, I mean, really. It's like, why don't I just get my chip, you know, inserted into my hand and then I can just tap and pay with my hand. That's kind of how this feels. Which that to me seems more reliable, I guess, than your phone scanning your palm print. I don't know. I don't, yeah, I'm not, but John, you're right, because you can open your iPhone. I mean, Hannah, do you have that? You have Face face ID on your phone, yeah, right? Yeah, I do. So I guess Amazon, I mean, I have Amazon on my phone, and Apple already has my face, and Clear has my eyeballs, so I'm pretty sure I shouldn't be that What's worried left? about my, right, pretty sure I shouldn't <laughs> be worried about my palm. Well, we are hearing um, that the Secretary of State is on his way to Kansas City for oral arguments with the Attorney General's office. Um, and that they are going to be arguing these abortion initiatives case um, today. So obviously we won't get a decision for a little bit. And the abortion stuff, even for someone who follows initiative petitions religiously, it has gotten really, really tricky. And so um, because of all of the different abortion initiatives that have been filed and all of the different litigation uh, that we've seen over the abortion initiatives. Um, and so you might have seen an article, I think it was in the Missouri Independent, that abortion initiatives are back in circuit court in Cole County. Those are a new set of initiatives. And for those initiatives, my understanding is all they're seeking to do is add some limited exceptions to Missouri's um, current um, current policy. And so I exceptions, I believe, for rape and incest. Um, the, the abortion initiatives that are, and we'll hear from Secretary of State here shortly, um, the abortion initiatives that are in uh, the courts today 
um, are the really far left leaning abortion initiatives. And if you recall, Cole County Circuit Court, at least on one set of them, completely rewrote the ballot uh, title in the ballot summary. And so that case is obviously headed to the Court of Appeals and we will uh, hopefully get some sort of final summary language um, here shortly. And then and the abortion people are saying that's that's really holding us up um, from we've seen some of the polling, haven't we? That was the saying that the the conservatives, when it comes to the abortion issue, aren't quite as conservative as as they've been presented as. Right. And so these new initiatives that just offer the exceptions, I think we would see really high polling for that. But I mean, the the initiatives that are in court today are so left leaning. I don't know how they've done polling and, and think that that's where our, where Missourians are, because I just don't think they are there. Um, but again, the ballot me- the ballot language could really matter. And a lot of people don't read the full language and they only read the hundred words printed on the ballot. And depending on how that is uh, formulated, it, I, I think it could matter uh, going forward. I think ultimately I expect to see at least one abortion measure on the ballot. It'll be interesting if we end up with more than one, but they still have to get out, get their ballot summary, and then get out and collect signatures. We know um, from the door knocking that they were already uh, collecting signatures uh, on the um, the minimum wage petition. Jobs with Justice has been out. They said People said they saw them at the Mizzou homecoming game, um, and they were knocking doors in Ashland. I, I don't, I haven't heard from any... <laughs> Do you think they're still knocking doors after they knocked on your door? Hopefully not. Hopefully I I discourage them. Um, But they they uh, I haven't heard any other rumors, though, of any other initiatives actually out there, uh, you know, them out there collecting signatures and they're running out.
before um, the court re, at least in one of the cases, the court rewrote the ballot summary. Um, I think there are two cases technically up on appeal. There's also new initiatives out that are more limited. They are just simply adding exceptions to Missouri's current um, ban on abortion. And those petitions, I think, are have been, um, there's been a suit filed and yes. that is headed to Cole County. Um, I suspect eventually also headed to the Court of Appeals. Well, and that's just it. I mean, Stephanie, it is a it is a little complex, so we'll try to sum it up. And it's we're going to have a live interview, I believe, with uh, the uh, Secretary of State in a moment. There are going to be some oral arguments in the case today in the Western District Court of Appeals in Kansas City. Attorney General Bailey is on his way right now to Kansas City. His solic- Solicitor General, who you know, Josh Devine, is on his way. The Secretary of State himself is going to be uh, Jay Ashcroft at that uh, thing. The case is called Anna Fitz versus James Anna Fitz James versus Secretary of State Ashcroft, and Bailey is going to brief the uh, the reporters apparently after the oral arguments today. But uh, you know, there's a well, it's 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 just complex. Let's put it that way. It is fair. It's fair to say it's complex because you have all these different petitions being filed, and it's it is a, it's very hard to follow. It, it really is, unless you just spend all your time looking at these things, and who knows what's going to happen. Then get the courts involved too. And and there ultimately there could end up being more than one abortion initiative on the ballot. Uh, we've got so many different ones filed, um, and we've seen that in Missouri before. At, you know, one, right. when we did medical marijuana, there were three separate medical marijuana initiatives on uh, on the ballot. So it, it could it could come down to that. And it, there's interesting rules that I think are largely unsolved in Missouri about what happens if you have two competing ballot measures on the same topic at the same election. Um, and typically the one with the most votes prevails over the other one um, to the extent they conflict, I believe is the rule. But Missouri really ever hasn't really face that question head on i thought we might with the medical marijuana but mm-hmm. um but we never ended up no, with that. We, we haven't it's a great point it's and it could happen i mean who knows we I guess technically you could have have multiple ones uh that, that that pass but um it's just not something you normally see usually it's just like riverboat gaming is a perfect example in 1992 the vote was on riverboat gaming. There was no competing measure. There was one, I'm just using that, I'll just pick a year, 1992. Term limits were on the, Greg Upchurch had it. Um, and I, I can tell you the incumbents, both Democrat and Republican, did not like the idea at the time of term limits, but it passed, but there was no competing measure. In those days, and I don't know when it started, but in those days you didn't have as many. Now it's just, you have all these petitions being turned in um, you know, on various issues. And most don't make it. We realize that. But a number do. Uh, in some ballots, sometimes, especially if there's a presidential election, you could theoretically have mo- many, many ballot issues. It takes takes a long time to vote, uh, for sure. By the same token, I guess it shows there's interest in all these things. Well, I'm looking at the list now of how many initiative petitions have been filed so far this year. Um, and again, essentially the process is you file the the petition with the Secretary of State's office, then the Secretary drafts the ballot summary, the auditor drafts the fiscal note summary. Um, and so we see, uh, but the first step is filing it with the Secretary of State. Obviously, after they get the ballot language, they have to go collect signatures. And that's a very difficult process, which is why we see the field of initiatives narrowed um, pretty substantially. But so far this year, we're at 167 that's initiatives. Huge. I just heard from Secretary of State's office, and they've they've have just told us Ashcroft's gone on a call right now from eight thirty to nine, so he's not going to be able to to, to join us All on right. that. So that that's that's unfortunate, but but no that 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 number again one hundred and sixty four, I believe one hundred and sixty seven. One hundred and sixty seven. That in mean we'd have to verify this with the Secretary of State whenever we have him on. I'd venture to say that's probably a record. I, I don't think it is. It, you don't think it is? No. Okay. You don't think so? Yeah. I think we've had had more in the past. Uh, it's just, it's it's a staggering amount of, of, it's still, whether it's a record or not, it's a staggering amount. Well, and there are tons of different topics and ones that you might, you know, want to check out. They're, they're all posted on the Secretary yes. of State's website, which I appreciate. The latest ones were filed by Joanne Franklin, and they're titled Missouri Advanced Practice Registered Nurses for Full Practice mm-hmm. Authority. Mm-hmm. So a lot of topics to be covered. But I think, you know, I have some other outstanding questions with respect to the initiative in that um, in that. Who does it drive to the ballot ultimately? So if abortion is on our ballot, you know, is it 
getting people out to vote that normally wouldn't vote? How does that affect um, how does that affect overall voter turnout? Or is it going to drive Democrats, uh, you know, depending on what measure ends up on the ballot? Is it going to drive Democrats to the to the polls? And then how does that affect our candidates at the statewide level? I don't think it matters. I think we're going to elect Republicans. It it creates a challenge for the voters out there because, you know, with one with ballot language that you see on initiative petitions, it can be misleading by design. And then sort of like going back to what Steph said about medical marijuana, all the different issues on the ballot. I think your voting public just ends up frustrated and confused well and you've got multiple and then they're going to have to do a lot of research and it is it is time consuming and i know john runs into this too stephanie all of those are newsworthy there are but my biggest priority is focusing on columbia boone county news and i know john's as jeff said he cold county and then you've got this other stuff out here too that is very important but i think it kind of gets neglected in a sense because because we have so many other priorities going on but i want to make one point about what you said about driving voter turnout the Democrats thought that a right to work, right to work in 2018, it did. It drove union people to the polls in August Big of time. 2018. But Still see the bumper stickers, don't you? Exactly, exactly. And there were, and, and right to work failed in even all the Republican counties. And the Democrats all believed at the time, hey, we won in all these Rep- Democrats and unions won in all these, you know, this right to work vote in these Republican counties, we're going to win big in November. It did not happen. They felt the same way when it happened in 2006 on the minimum wage. They thought the same thing about Medicaid expansion. Um, it may pick them up some seats. Now, abortion may be different. I don't know. But it, but if you look at the past, even though these measures that go on the ballot are more progressive, if you will, you look, marijuana, which, by the way, only passed in about eight counties, but passed statewide, right to work failed in darn near every county in the state you would think that that would translate into more democratic victories if you would think that but but it has not it is simply not and you're right statewide but even at a lot of the legislative seats it is not either yeah i don't think it matters at the statewide level but i know in the last election on the on the legislative seats there were several several races either for state house or state senate that were only separated by That's right. less than 100 votes and so i think in those races could it could it play yes. a factor i think probably brian you mentioned uh focusing right here on mid-missouri and i do want to say mm-hmm. um it, it, here uh let's see oh so they're accepting um columbia the city of columbia if you happen to be a resident of the city of columbia they are accepting election petitions available to run for the second that's and right. sixth awards and that's for the election in the spring um andrea Weiner has also uh resigned early and so they're currently accepting up ap- and that's in war two they're currently accepting applications and they're going to fill that vacancy and then of course war two will be up for election in april, in april. but we are always uh you know one of our big things here on the show is encouraging people to get involved um, and so, you know, if you're in and around mid-Missouri, make sure you're watching those election um, deadlines. Um, and if you're interested in running, that you're um, talking to your clerk's office or, get, or you know, finding out the appropriate information. Because those deadlines um, th- have moved and they can be, um, uh, they can be uh, difficult. To, they're, they're easy to miss because they typically fall kind of around the holidays. Yeah, exactly. And a lot, of the, a lot of the people listening are so focused on what's happening with President Biden or former President Trump. All that's important. Everything in Jefferson City is important. But there is no question in ter- terms of the daily impact on your lives, what happens in Jefferson City, when I say locally, and then you got the capital as well in Columbia make, make, makes a, a makes a big di- a bigger difference than a lot of the federal issues because those are the issues there at home. By the way, the deadline tomorrow is for people to turn in their uh, roll cart request as well for oh. Columbia. They need to get that done. <laughs> oh, no, they, we haven't said that word know, on the program in a while. So roll, roll carts. I've actually had a couple people reach out complaining about roll carts uh, again. Really? Uh, I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, they're they're concerned about it. But yeah, the deadline is to select is tomorrow. Something else locally that I wanted to ask you about, Brian, was this planned explosion yesterday that went wrong. I think it was, was it the Roachport Bridge? Oh, the, uh, the, the, the they had to shut down a, and John can chime in on this too, they had to shut down a couple of the lanes when they did the demolition. They found they did a, an inspection. They found some, basically some damage, maybe some debris 
on some of the lanes. So they 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 closed it late. I want to say it was late Saturday night. Uh, excuse me, late Sunday, Sunday evening and yesterday. I get my days confused. And then opened it about 6 o'clock this morning. But they did not provide a whole lot of details on well, that. No, they didn't say a lot, but no. they said it damaged the bridge deck on the eastbound lane, eastbound, but they had yes. it patched up. Because yeah, exactly. it went south. And I'm thinking, like, if we are blowing things up on purpose, like, shouldn't we, like, control the debris spread? That's That was just, it sounds like something went south on that. And well, it just and- seems like if we're blowing stuff up, like, we should... We should make sure we do it right, I guess. Yeah, and, and you've got a lot. And, and then they did supposedly check after they, they did when they talked about the truss. Um, and the truss took much longer to get out of the river than they, they originally inspected. I don't know if the weather had something to do with it, but they did the – apparently it's all – according to them, it's all safe and fixed right now. Yeah, all these the, were those. the piers on the old bridge is what they were demolishing that, this time. That, that's right. And, uh, and my understanding was for – both of the lanes were closed for a while, uh, and then one lane was closed for sure. I believe it was the driving lane was closed until six o'clock this morning. But yes, that is what happened. But very, John's right. There's not. There's very little information in that release. All right. Well, we will uh, do leftovers next. We always like to talk about how, and and I know you guys.
listening to Wake Up Mid-Missouri. We've got um, some leftovers in the fridge. I was following this article um, from the Columbia, Missouri. And now we know earlier this year, the Supreme Court issued its opinion. Um, and this is the United States Supreme Court issued its opinion in the Harvard case, um, the Students for Fair Admissions case. And there they basically held that Harvard's college admission system didn't comply with the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and struck that down and said, uh, and basically, uh, then the attorney general, our attorney general, sent a letter to all Missouri universities saying, hey, uh, you need to, quote, immediately cease your practice of using race-based standards to make decisions about things like admission, scholarships, uh, programs, and employment. Uh, And Mizzou has said, yeah, we're going to end race-based scholarships. So the Columbia Missourian profiled a few students who would be um, potentially losing out on those scholarships. Um, and Mizzou is saying that um, this year's freshman class is the last to benefit from those race-based scholarships. That kind of surprises me coming from Mizzou, especially. Well, the court said what it said. I guess so that's true. I think the attorney general has shown that if you're gonna <laughs> uh, if, if you're gonna uh, do something unconstitutional, he's ready to take you to court. So. Mess around and find out type of thing. Yes, exactly. John, what do you have for leftovers? We have this just into us from our affiliate in Springfield, KWTO, a man who robbed a Springfield bank masquerading as Superman in September has been arrested in his home state of Mississippi. 50-year-old Scott Diner was accused of robbing the Legacy Bank down in Springfield of 5000 bucks, And they have the photos that show him wearing his Superman t-shirt as he held up the bank. He is now behind bars, and I guess uh, it proved to be his kryptonite. <laughs> that'll do it i like it all right uh i've also been monitoring this case and they've had some big wins this is the rockbridge stadium naming rights case and if you recall um it's uh wayne cells um donated some money to rockbridge they put his name and this was many years ago put his name on the field it says wayne cells family activity field yeah, then, didn't he pay for the scoreboard the expensive new scoreboard i want to say it was like a hundred thousand dollars um yeah. it was and so he um, he made a Facebook post that they didn't like. It was about, I believe, about NFL players kneeling. And the school said, yeah, we don't like what you're posting on Facebook, so we're going to take your name off of the field. Now, he sued and said, I paid for that, um, but never had a true uh, contract. Um, and so a lot of it has been over. I, I know initially it was over, you know, was there an actual contract? I think the court initially said um, that there was because the check constituted a writing. Anyway, we're getting a little bit nerdy and it's even more nerdy. A little bit. It's even nerdier than that <laughs> in that the, the court has now um, essentially uh, dismissed the lawsuit because they said the check was actually not written by Mr. Sells, but by uh, it appears to be a business entity that he owns. Um, and so Mr. Sells personally is not the right party. Uh, Mr. Sell's uh, attorneys have said, we're just going to sue with the new party. Like, we'll be back. So I just, I think it's ridiculous that the school took his name off after he said something. You know, you shouldn't be having to look at Yeah, they his took shoulder. his money and spent it. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, like, if you're going to take his name off, may as well give the money back. I, I, I would highly agree with you. John, anything else locally here for leftovers or otherwise? You know, I, I was just, our whole discussion we had with Brian reference initiative petitions and all kind of rocked back to something that Caleb Browden talked to us about and also championed. There's a whole idea of initiative petition reform because a lot of those issues we talked about, if the if the margin was a 60% total, a lot of that stuff wouldn't have passed. Oh, you're exactly right. And I've thought about that as well. And it's happened in other states where if, you know, the legislature was to do something now about initiative petition reform, the entire narrative is going to be, well, they're just doing it to prevent, um, you know, any changes to abortion. It's all about, you know, preventing and blocking the abortion initiatives. And that's been the narrative in other states. And the other states have tried to say, no, look, we've been working on initiative petition reform for 10 years, even before the Supreme Court's decision. Um, and so this is this doesn't really have to do about, you know, it's not about abortion. It's just about initiative petition reform. But I know the minute the legislature oh, goes to sure. try to touch you. initiatives, that's going to be the only narrative. But you think, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of people playing kind of armchair quarterback or, you know, looking in the past and saying, after we see the 2024 ballot saying what how, what would have been different if we would have played nice in the legislature and done initiative petition reform and i think there are going to be many people that wished that they had done something earlier and you know if we end up with minimum wage and abortion and a couple of abortion uh, measures 
that's going to be, I think that's going to make it tough for some people in some close races. And we know in some areas like Boone County and like um, Springfield, you know, the districts aren't as red on the local level as they used to be. So it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Um, Change the playing field for sure. It really does. And I think the polling on that, I think is is so, um, is so close on some of those that the difference between 50% and 60% would certainly make a difference. All right, coming up. Uh, We're going to have the Gary Nolan show, but tomorrow uh, Mark Ellinger will be in co-hosting. We're going to walk through some of the new uh, processes.